Uh, so thank you all for inviting me uh, to this conference. Uh, I'm sorry if I have some video issues, please let me know because this is a very hacky setup here. Uh, let's see if we can see the whole board. Yes, now this seems okay. Um, all right. So, um, so today um, I'm going to talk about a conjecture of Kantsevich uh, having to do with operands. Um, and there will be two main characters. Uh, both of them operands, both of them operands that probably all of you know. Um, but I'll just take three minutes uh, drawing a picture of a representative element of each operand. Uh, the first operand is the operand of little disks. Uh, so it's um, operation spaces. These are topological operands. It's operation spaces are configurations of n non-overlapping disks uh, in a larger unit disk. Uh, and the second operand, its close cousin, is the operand of framed little disks. Uh, and this is the operand of, of, that encodes the same type of configuration data. Uh, here, let me draw this a little bigger. Uh, uh, so let's draw something like uh, this. So this is an element in the two operation space, sorry, FLD2. Uh, and but with, with an additional piece of data, namely you encode a, a marked point on the boundary of every little disk. Um, and so these marked points get um, incorporated into the gluing, where if, for example, we want to encode another configuration, uh, say this one, uh, into, or let, let me actually draw it in some other color, blue. If we want to uh, compose this configuration of little disks into this um, input disk of gamma, then the result is going to first uh, rotate the configuration we're gluing in such a way that the base point matches, and then rescaling and gluing it in as we do for ordinary little disks. So for in this case, I, I rotate by 90 degrees clockwise, and I end up with a configuration like this. Uh, the mark points also get rotated, um, and the disk where we glue gets removed as is usual for this type of situation. Uh, so this, um, these are our two main characters. Um, and I will talk about a number of results about, um, well, mostly this operand, but, but in fact, both of these operands, um, starting with formality. So this is variously known as, as the Lean's formality conjecture or, or the formality conjecture. Um, but before I get into this, I want to um, demonstrate a, a technique for proving formality results, um, which um, is, is sort of a baby example and does not use operand structure. Um, and maybe I should say um, just um, to avoid technicalities that uh, so we're interested in properties like formality, like, like structures on the chain complex. Um, so maybe let me make uh, an aside that will be true throughout the talk that I'm going to re retain the freedom to, uh, so replace an operand by, uh, canonically quasi-isomorphic one one uh, without 
telling you. So let me say, uh, I ask the freedom to do this. Um, so we're, we're working in some model category and some homotopy category and um, just to avoid um, uh, technicalities that, that do not add to um, the uh, uh, to an understanding of the picture, I'm going to be free to, to move around um, different models so long as they are canonically quasi-asymorphic. Um, and so that said, now I want to look at a particular model, not for one of these operads, but for a particular operation space of one of these operads. So I'm going to fix n for a little bit. And I'm going to set up a baby example, namely, uh, I'm going to look at the nth space of the little disks operand. So this is now just a topological space. And so using my, my this aside, I, I can uh, uh, point out that this um, little disk space is canonically quasi-asymorphic via a, a pair of maps to the space of configurations of endpoints on uh, the complex plane. I think you guys have had uh, one speaker who, who talked about configuration spaces. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure everybody can, can figure out what this is, but uh, let me just say that this has elements which are just tuples of distinct points distinct points of C. Um, so this is a, a useful model, not because it has operad structure, in fact. Uh, so these do not form an operad when N varies. So that's a big problem for a number of sort of operad theoretic questions. But on the other hand, um, there's a big advantage of this space, which is that this is an algebraic variety. Unlike the configuration space of little disks, which is only a real topological space. So this is an algebraic variety over C. And in fact, um, it can be made an algebraic variety uh, over the rational numbers. In other words, just the um, equations, uh, defining equations are defined over Q. Um, and so um, as people who um, have worked with topology know, this, this is a very, very powerful um, statement, even if I'm only interested in the algebraic topology of, of, this, of this space. And, and the reason is that, um, for example, chains on a, um, an algebraic variety have a lot of extra structures. So they have things like mixed Hodge structure. Um, uh, and uh, uh, a structure that we'll talk about today, which is Galois equivariance. Uh, so this means the, the consequence of this is that this particular configuration space has uh, extra structure. And so the, the structure that I'm going to single out and in some sense the most universal structure that you can get from algebraic geometry is that chains, or let's say that the most universal stable structure that you can get is the chains on this configuration space, which remember is equivalent to our little disk space, uh, are, uh, let's, are, are motivic. Uh, so let me say, uh, can be enriched to a motive. And 
uh, I, I left some space before the word motive because there are many different um, notions of what a motive means. There are many different uh, categories of motives. And in this case, in some sense, the strongest one, the most general one is a Voyevodsky motive, Voyevodsky morale. Um, and uh, as a Voyevodsky motive, so this is a second, a second thing. Uh, so this is not, not just any Voyevodsky motive, but it's a very nice one. Uh, so here I should say chains and co-chains. Chains and co-chains and chains can be enriched to Voyevodsky motive. Uh, and moreover, this, this motive is uh, a Tate motive. So this is a Tate motive. Uh, so uh, uh, um, algebraic variety that, that corresponds to Tate motive is an algebraic variety essentially that you can build out of projective spaces. So the configuration space is essentially just the nth power of C, which is um, just a projective line without a point, uh, except you have to remove some other uh, copies of affine space, uh, which um, do not change the property of this motive of, of, of the space being of Tate type. Um, so this is some, some technical detail. Uh, yes. For, for those who, uh, for those of us who do not know what a motive is, is this uh, like. You, you, you should it? wait uh, five seconds. All right, very well, yeah. thank you. Uh, all right, um, so. So it's a Voyevodsky motive and moreover a Tate Voyevodsky motive, right. Um, and so um, what is a motive? A motive is, uh, so it's a collection of structures uh, called realizations. Realizations uh, that enrich the, um, well, the algebra of coaching. Uh, enriching. Well, in this case, it's not. Maybe it's not just the Voivodsky motive, but it's an algebra. So co-chains. Well, let me, let me just talk about co-chains, so I don't have to talk about co-algebras. Uh, are enriched to an algebra in Voivodsky um, motives. And so again, what, what, what does this mean? This means that there, there are various structures that enrich the, the chain structure. And so in fact, there is a, a universal um, enriching structure, which is very mysterious and, and somehow, um, uh, except for a small number of cases, it's, it's unknown, um, sort of what it looks like. But um, j just like a topological space, which can have many different um, generalized homology theories associated with it, um, so, so the, the fact that this has a, a motive implies that essentially any generalized homology theory on algebraic varieties uh, gives us a new structure uh, on um, so somehow a, a new structure um, which enriches this algebra of co-chains. Uh, and so I'm going to um, single out a, a particularly useful one, which is that if I take the co-chains and I um, base change to, so for technical reasons, it turns out you need a base change, not to any characteristic zero field, but to the field of piadic numbers. Um, so of this configuration space. So this uh, is equivariant. So this is an, an it's still a, a ring. So it's a ring. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, equivariant ring for uh, the absolute Galois group of QP. Oh, sorry, of Q, not QP. Of Q, Q bar over Q. Uh, sorry. One second. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let me see. Uh, 
Can you guys see me? I seem to. Oops. Uh, it seems frozen. Yeah, sorry about this. Uh, can you see me now? Yes. Now I can see you. Sorry about that. Okay, great. All right. Uh, Yeah, so, so the particular structure, so, um, right, so what does, what, what does a motive mean? It's, it's a bunch of different things, but, but one particular thing that it means is that if we base change, uh, then there is a, an action of a group. In fact, in fact, there is a sense in which all the motivic structure sa says that for different, when we base change to different fields or rings, we'll have action by different groups. Uh, and so in this case, the, the group that acts is a group that, that contains as a subgroup, this very large group, um, which is a Galois group. Uh, and in particular, in this Galois group, we have these special elements called Frobenius elements. Um, they're actually associated to every prime. But I, I, so if you fix a Frobenius element, this, this says that, um, that this Cauchy algebra um, will break down into eigenspaces for this Frobenius element in a canonical way. So this means that on chain level, level, this coaching algebra has an additional grading. Uh, this coaching algebra has a grading by eigenvalues of this Frobenius element. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a uh, DG commutative algebra with this additional grading. And um, so this implies formality. So uh, this is something that I also didn't explain. Um, so this implies that, uh, so the following lemma, uh, namely that uh, this algebra, uh, well, with QP coefficients, the configuration space is isomorphic to the homology with the same coefficients of the configuration space as commutative DG algebras. So there's a, a canonical sequence of quasi isomorphisms that, that relates these. Uh, so this is, this is known as formality. Uh, so this chain algebra, chain algebra of a particular space is formal. Uh, so here I should point out that in order for, for the formality, we, we actually, we need to be sure that the weight grading by Frobenius coincides with the homological grading. And so that's, that uses this Tate property. So there's some, some technical words I have to say. That's why I mentioned that it's Tate. Uh, but essentially the, the so, so formality often means that there's some canonical grading that um, takes us out of the domain of homological algebra into the domain of, of just graded algebra. Um, and so this grading can be, can be given by the Frobenius. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about formality is that once we have formality in any characteristic zero field, it implies formality in any other characteristic zero field. So that means that uh, in fact, the configuration algebra uh, with coefficients in Q, so here I said QP, but in fact, this implies that the configuration, the Cauchy algebra, the coefficients in Q is formal. This time, not quite as canonically, well, not canonically. So there is some alternative way of writing down formality as the vanishing of certain obstruction classes that um, are defined over uh, any characteristic zero field. Um, okay, so, so this is a little story. Um, that, that tells that, that demonstrates that the following uh, the following procedure that we start with the topological space that's a configuration space of something useful in operads we convert it to an algebraic variety and then we use the extra structure um, that this motivic philosophy uh, gives to topological invariance of algebraic varieties to deduce some strong statement uh, about the, the, the homotopy theory involved. In this case, the statement is that co-chains are quasi-isomorphic to cohomology, right? This is something that whenever you learn about um, something like um, 
at algebras or R prize, the first thing you learn is that you need to keep track of not, not just uh, the cohomology structure, but also the chain structure. So in this case, we, we have this nice statement uh, that um, one determines the other. Um, and again, and so the, the, the technique we, we used is we went through algebraic geometry and deduced um, via this number theory coming from the motivic voodoo, a, a strong statement about the topology. So, so now I want to um, repeat something very similar to this, except instead of looking at the algebra structure on a single configuration space, I want to look at all of the configuration spaces together and um, consider the operad structure. But, but first I wanted to ask if there's any questions. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so let me write down uh, a sequence of results. So we erase this. Uh, write down a sequence of results, uh, which will sort of mirror um, the story that I told you over there. And I will tell you um, to what extent the, the story can be repeated and generalized for algebras, or sorry, for operas, uh, and what additional ingredients you need. And so this, this will be the main uh, point of the talk. Uh, so so let, me, let me now uh, consider the opera of little disks all together, right? We were focusing on a single one. Uh, actually, let me move this closer to the middle and get rid of this. So I'm gonna look at the opera of all little disks. And I'm gonna write down a sequence of questions and a sequence of answers. Uh, so the first question is, is the operad of little disks formal as an operad? So what does this mean? Well, um, I, I'm making some statement about, about uh, chains or co-chains and in order to go from an operad of spaces to an operad of uh, complexes, we should take not co-chains this time, but chains. So, so let me write down the question. So is the operad of chains of little disks formal? Um, and so um, the, the answer, of course, is yes. Um, and eventually we hope to, to um, uh, deduce this from, from a similar kind of argument as, as I just used for a single configuration space for the algebra uh, of co-chains uh, using some algebraic geometry. However, unfortunately, uh, that's not quite as easy. For, for a reason that I'll, that I'll show you in, in a minute. Uh, so um, the answer is yes, but, but this, was, this, was, this was quite a hard question. Uh, and so this was proven originally by Tamarkin, but somehow in parallel also by Kantsevich in the early 2000s. Uh, and this was, uh, so, so I guess Tamarkin is or the original paper. Uh, and so this was done uh, using techniques very similar to Kantsevich's proof of um, geometric, um, geometric quantization. Uh, and in fact, it was seen very quickly that this, um, this formality implies a very powerful question originally coming from physics called the geometric quantization. So the, the question here is, suppose that I have um, some algebra functions with a Poisson bracket. So that's something that, that lets you do classical mechanics. Uh, and the question is, can that Poisson bracket be upgraded to a quantum bracket? So something that lets you do quantum mechanics. Um, uh, assuming the, algebra, the Poisson algebra comes from a Poisson manifold, um, and so this was proven originally by Kantsevich. Uh, 
uh, basically he proved uh, uh, a partial result, a partial version of, of this formality. Um, and then and then Tamarkin proved it, and, and for Tamarkin, this was uh, the, the main application of this result was something called Deline's conjecture. Have people here heard of Deline's conjecture? Is that let's see, can people hear me? Hello. Yes. I can hear oh, you. Cool. Okay, so so is, is this something that uh, most people here know? Deline's conjecture. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So maybe I'll say like for, for three minutes, I'll explain that. Um, so Deleuze's conjecture um, is a conjecture about uh, certain uh, chain level structures on Hochschild cohomology. Uh, it was conjectured by Deleuze. Um, and it's in, in modern language, it's actually quite easy and quite formal. Uh, it follows from the language of EN algebras, uh, but uh, at the time that this language was not quite as well developed and the first proof in fact, in fact involved this quite elaborate formality result. Okay, so that's the first question. Um, so now I want to um, work backwards from our baby example where this formality was proven using, um, using uh, the QP cohomology and Galois action and motives. Uh, and see how much of this we can we can uh, recover in the con context of operands. Qu questions? Okay. Uh, so the next question is: Does uh, okay? So by the way, here I should say formality really very rarely holds with integer coefficients. You always almost always want to take characteristic zero coefficients. Um, and so. Next question is, uh, what if I take QP coefficients? Well, we know that every individual space has a Galois action. Uh, so the question is, does this have uh, action by the absolute Galois group? Uh, which, uh, which is compatible with the operand structure. With the operad structure. Uh, and the answer to this is also known, and it's also yes. Um, and so that was a, a subsequent, I mean, essentially, this is contained in this, in this subsequent paper sort of to Markin. Um, and he proved, in fact, not just the fact there's a go action, he proved a bigger action by something called the Groth and Dieck Müller group. Uh, in fact, there is a growth and Dieck Müller group action. So this is just some some more general version of the Galois group. Uh, and so uh, again, this was proven using. So so this was proven. This was th these results were proven using uh, well some combination of analytic um, and. Um, geometric techniques. This result was proven using something called Rinfeld associators. So that's a, another, uh, another object in algebra that for a while had been mysterious and, and had a sort of miraculous analytic proof. Uh, and in fact, now it's known that um, there is, uh, uh, so that this statement is essentially equivalent to the, so, so some kind of statements about Drinfeld associators, similar covariance and existence of Drinfeld associators. Okay, so these are all somehow techniques that have um, very simple and algebraic statements, but their proofs go through some quite elaborate geometry analysis uh, and um, combinatorics, so some growth and technical combinatorics. Um, uh, and uh, now it's also known, uh, so this was a folklore result, but, but uh, carefully proven by uh, uh, Joanna Chirici and Geoffroy Corel, um, that this statement implies this statement. Oops, Chirici Corel, sorry. 
uh, this statement in place. This statement, again, using a similar kind of Frobenius uh, action, except it's a little bit more elaborate here. Uh, and so, um, as a result of all of this um, sort of, uh, all of these known ideas, um, let me see. Uh, uh, Kansevich conjectured uh, that, uh, in fact, this operator of chains on little disks is a motive. So this is something that, as I as I explained, would imply the Galois action, and in fact, it would imply this formality in, in a number of different ways. Uh, and so here, maybe I should also be a little bit um, careful. Um, so the the maybe the, the most interesting conjecture there there is a there is a sense in which um, uh, once you have a growth in the Miller action, you have um, a, a Tate motive in characteristic zero under certain assumptions. Um, but maybe a more interesting question is: Are our chains with z coefficients? Do they do they form a motive? Do they do they have action by by every possible group that you can have acting on the homology of algebraic varieties or in chains of algebraic varieties? Um, and so there's there's in fact a, a further generalization of this, um, which is uh, you can ask whether L D itself is so maybe more generally you can ask is L D itself uh, um, unstable or non-commutative motive. So there is a, a slight generalization, stable motive, which I won't get into. Um, and so um, this was not known. Um, and um, so, so it's, this is a little bit maybe surprising that, that we don't know this for the operand, but we know this for every space independently. Um, so a conjecture that one could ask is maybe, maybe, so this would definitely follow if we could write down, uh, okay, so right here. So is the operator of little disks uh, equivalent in some canonical way to uh, an operad uh, of algebraic varieties, or maybe more generally, schemes um, so so this one okay so so here we we we, we have a, a set of implications each one stronger than the previous one so we know that the, the two weakest ones are true that, that this one is a conjecture and this one is simply quite false uh, so there is no way to make the the maps the the composition maps or gluing maps between little disks algebraic. So, um, and this has to do with the fact that there are no maps from, uh, no maps from P1 without three points. So, um, we're equivalently think of this as the complex numbers without zero or one. Uh, to P1 without two points, so complex numbers without zero, uh, which are algebraic. Uh, let's see, no, no algebraic. In fact, there's not even no complex analytic maps of this type. This is a famous theorem on complex analysis. And this essentially implies that there, there can be no, even after allowing a lot more uh, freedom and, and a, a, a lot of sort of uh, uh, e even somehow in an up to homotopy sense, you cannot make the operator of little disks purely algebraic. Um, so, so this is what makes what makes this motivic conjecture hard. Um, and um, so, so. It turns out that the motivic conjecture is true. Uh, so this follows um, 
so from uh, essentially from a recent paper of mine. Uh, and um, so I'm going to explain how, how to get this. So, so this is the, the um, main result for, for today. Um, and so th there's this unfortunate sort of reality that, that uh, if we're, for example, interested in a single configuration space, then uh, this, this last bo bottom statement will imply all, all the others. And so, so you can essentially reduce everything, so formality, Galois action, et cetera, to simple algebraic geometry. Um, and so because this last statement is, is false, uh, this statement is difficult, these two statements cannot be proved using simple algebraic geometry and that you need these analytic or, or arithmetic type Miller combinatorial results, which are quite transcendental and sort of um, much harder than, than this case of a simple single configuration space. Um, and so, um, how, how, would you, how would you prove a, a motivicity result without having an algebraicity result? Well, it turns out that, that um, you, you do this by, by so, so you can do this by, by modifying the problem a little bit such that the last line is actually true. So let me maybe write on the other board a few words and then I'm going to modify this diagram uh, to make the last line true. Um, so, uh, so it turns out that even though the, the thing that would most directly imply this is not, is not true, you can, you can, as is often true in mathematics, you can modify your definitions, you can weaken all of your requirements uh, in order to still get what you need. Um, and so what are our modifications? So, so the modifications that we're going to need are, so, okay, so let me, let me once again, let me write down the idea of proof. Uh, of this Konsevich motivicity conjecture. Conjecture. Maybe let me first write it down as a theorem. So let me say this is theorem one. And the theorem is, so I'm going to write it out carefully that uh, the algebra of chains, say with Z coefficients on the operad of little disks, uh, is, uh, well, is a motive. So I'm going to write some technical words, which mean that it's a motive. Is Betty realization of uh, a Voyevodsky motive. Uh, an operad in the category, an operad in the category, the DG category or infinity category of uh, Voivodsky motivic complexes. Okay. Uh, so this is the theorem. Uh, and so the idea of proof of proof is to modify the picture such that the last line uh, that the operad is, is algebra geometric uh, is true. So we need to get around these, these essential problems with making algebra geometric. And so this requires two modifications. Again. So the first one is we pass from the more famous of our two operads, of our two characters uh, to it's less famous, but more geometric, as it turns out, cousin, framed little disks. Uh, and the second one is we pass from the category of algebraic varieties. This is a category uh, to the category of um, logarithmic or log algebraic varieties. Um, so what does it mean to be a log algebraic variety? Uh, so, so here, quick dictionary entry. 
I'm not going to define a, a log algebraic variety for you, but I'm going to explain roughly what it is. So uh, a log algebraic variety, uh, a log algebraic variety, you should think of it as some kind of, um, um, uh, so it's, it's, first of all, it's a classical variety. Uh, so it's the, the following data. So X is just an ordinary variety. You should think of this as some kind of a physical universe. Uh, and then D inside of X, um, not necessarily a divisor, but frequently a divisor is a closed sub variety, which we think of as the points at infinity. So if you're thinking of physics, you can assume that sort of the metric become, blows up at infinity and you can't get to these points in finite time. Uh, but, so a closed sub variety, uh, but, um, so at these infinite points, you, you have some extra information um, explaining how your universe behaves when you approach infinity. And so, so this is some boundary data. So it's given by some monoid, but I'm not going to explain it, define it rigorously. So boundary data at infinity. At D. Okay. So that's the rough sketch. Uh, any questions? So this is the program that we want to um, perform uh, to 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 get motivicity and to get formality. So questions? Okay. Uh, so okay. So so now. Uh, I'm going to modify all these statements to make them true, and I'm going to now go from the bottom up. So, so we get this chain of implications. Um, and uh, since this is recorded anyway, I'm, I'm going to do the thing you're not supposed to do when people are taking notes, which is I'm going to modify this board. Uh, so uh, remember our two main modifications. So, so the modification to make this last line true is instead of little disks, we write down framed little disks. Uh, let me just go ahead and, and replace every instance of little disks with framed. Uh, framed little disks. Uh, and the second thing is we, we replace um, algebraic varieties by log algebraic varieties. So log. Uh, and so, um, so let me, there's a little bit of a, of a technicality that uh, actually uh, a weaker version of this is in my paper, but um, I've since uh, sort of uh, uh, had, had a um, slightly stronger result, which is that, so a priori when you replace algebraic varieties by log, I'll write this actually a little bigger, algebraic varieties, um, then you don't get motives, but you get something else called log motives. Uh, where you get the log motives, these log motives do have a Galois action. So, so this, this arrow is still there, and this was known for a long time. Uh, but, but it's also that there's some, there, there's some slight hurdles um, in, in, the, in the theory that, that you need to get to get from, to, to get the actual Kantsevich conjecture, which is, to remove the word log here. Um, and so it turns out that, that actually you can, so, so there's, there's a functor from ordinary motives to log motives. Um, sorry, for, sorry, there's a functor from log motives to ordinary motives that, that tells you that if you have a, a diagram of logarithmic algebraic varieties, then you will also get, in some sense, a, a corresponding diagram of, of classical motives. So there's a, there's, a, there's a way to eliminate this word here. So in fact, the log motive is more information than a motive. So you can recover the, the ordinary motive. So, so there's some, there's some I, I'm sorry about this, this slight nitpicking, uh, but, but there is some, some way to get rid of the word here. So the only place we need to write the word log is in here. Okay, so, so um, the frame little disks. So, so now I'm going to make all my statements about frame little disks from, for a moment. Uh, so frame little disks are an operand of log algebraic varieties. Um, 
therefore their chains have the structure of an operad in log in regular motifs. So this is this nitpicking that uh, requires a little bit of extra work. Uh, therefore, the conservative conjecture is true. Right. Uh, uh, at least, so, so the conjecture, the conservative conjecture for framed little disks is true. And of course, uh, once this is true, then this implies everything else. This implies, well, the framed little disks have Galois action uh, and are formal. Um, so these are results that, that were also known, though they were proven, I think, after the corresponding results for little disks. Uh, okay, so, so this, is, this is the picture. Uh, the, the, of course, the main thing that I haven't told you yet is how to get uh, this operand of log algebraic varieties, which represents, so, so by the way, once, once we put in this word log, this, this, this becomes true. So what I haven't told you is how to get, write down this operand of log algebraic varieties, which represents the operand of framed little disks. So it's something that maybe I'll tell you in the very, very condensed form. Uh, and then the, the final thing that I will owe you in order to, um, to uh, deduce the classical Kantsevich conjecture is how to get from frame little disks to little disks. So there's a little trick that lets you go from frame little disks to little disks. Uh, let me ask if there's any questions now. So are you going to tell us what a morphism of log algebraic varieties is? I suppose there's not a forgetful functor uh, from log algebraic varieties to algebraic varieties, even though there is one for motive. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what a morphism of log algebraic varieties is. There's, I mean, there's a couple of different definitions. Uh, in, in this case, uh, yeah, any, any, any of the definitions work. And any of the definitions will result in a, in a functor from uh, log algebraic varieties to, to, from log motives to regular motives. So there's, there's a functor, which is essentially you remove the log structure. So that, that only works for smooth schemes, but then you extend it to motives by some trick. Um, so I, I won't, I'm sorry, that, that may, maybe you can ask it in, in the end, but I, I don't have time right now to explain a little bit more about the category of log schemes. So, so the intuition is just that uh, you're allowing now these maps where, for instance, you have P1 minus three points to P1 minus two points in your category. Right. So. And, and why is that? Why is that? So, well, the, uh, uh, the intuition is that, oh, let's see, how, how do I, how do I interpret such a map? Uh, Sorry, from P1 minus, no, no, the, the, the map may, maybe, oh, did I write it backwards? I did write it backwards. There's an obvious map in this direction, sorry. There's an obvious map from this direction, which is, the, this is a sub variety of this one. I, I meant, of course, the other direction. And the intuition here is that, so as a, so as a log motive, this is equivalent to P1 with three log points. Um, this is equivalent to P1 with two log points, but, but this is also equivalent to a so-called uh, log point or a, a log uh, point sub log. So, so the monoid is the natural numbers. So, so there is essentially an infinitesimal. So, so P1 without two points is GM. And there is the, the key fact is that there is an infinitesimal G1 in the log category. There's a tiny little G1, which like, why, why is this? So why is this something that that doesn't come up in topology. Well, in topology, you can P1 minus two points is equivalent to just a circle. P1 minus three points is the same as P1 and you remove three disks. So obviously you can map the circle to the boundary of one of those disks. So that's something that you can do in log, log geometry. That's, that's the intuition. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Cool, uh, awesome. Okay, so, so let me very quickly explain. So, so I, I owe you two things. Uh, the first one is uh, why uh, right, so, so very roughly, uh, so uh, I owe you two things. First of all, a logarithmic version of the operator framed little disks, which I'm just going to call it uh, framed little disks sub log. Uh, and the second one is going from framed to unframed. Uh, and uh, I'll try to very quickly go through both of them. Um, 
So for number one, just like, for, just like my dictionary entry for log schemes, I can only give you a very vague intuition. Uh, and the very vague intuition is that, uh, well, uh, I'm gonna define the uh, nth configuration space uh, of frame little disk sub log uh, to be uh, okay. I'm just I'm I'm just going to write some words, and I'll try to give a very vague intuition of what they mean. Uh, so this is uh, genus zero logarithmic curves with an incoming, sorry, with an outgoing, no, no, you want an incoming, sorry. It doesn't matter, of course. It, an incoming and one outgoing boundary components, components together with a parametrization of the log boundary. Um, and so what, is, what does this mean um, geometrically? Well, geometrically, this means that we have uh, a curve of genus zero and we have some marked points. Oh, sorry, and these should be stable, of course. Otherwise they don't form a nice configuration space. Um, so we have a stable nodal curve of genus zero uh, except we, we want to interp interpret the, the marked points and the nodes as logarithmic. And what this means geometrically on the level of geometric realization is that all of these um, turn into a real circle. So there's a, a certain way of getting uh, um, geometric space out of a, a log space, which, is, which says that whenever we have a point at infinity, there is a whole circle of ways to approach it. Um, and so this goes into the geometry of the logarithmic um, space. Same with a node, a node turns into a whole circle of essentially possible gluings. Um, uh, and, and my parametrization is just, just uh, so there's a notion of a log point, which whose realization is, a, is this sort of small circle. Um, and so there is a finite dimensional set of maps from the circle to every boundary condition at infinity. I choose one of these maps very, very roughly, and then there's a gluing procedure. Um, so this is a, a very simplified picture, um, which you need to say a few more words to make formal. Uh, but once you have this picture, then, um, so there is this idea that has been known for a long time, uh, starting with um, some uh, uh, papers by Kimura, Stashup, and Voronov, I think, uh, and also, uh, related to work of Costello that uh, framed little disks have a realization in terms of these um, little blowups of uh, nodal curves of genus zero. Um, so this, this implies uh, that once we, we make this formalism uh, concrete and explicit in the, the category of log varieties, then um, there's some, some classical results that imply that it's equivalent to the category of framed little disks. Uh, okay, so, so I'm gonna um, say that we're done with one. Again, I'm sorry, this is a very sketchy explanation. Uh, and so what about two? Well, two, there's, a, there's actually a very nice uh, picture. Uh, and and the, um, the picture is that, in fact, you cannot make the operator of little disks into an operator of log varieties. There is, once again, some, some kind of serious obstructions. But what you can instead do is you can write it down as a, as a um, fiber, uh, as a fiber of operands. Uh, and so let me, um, you, you, can, you can actually explain this, this fiber construction very classically. Namely, uh, so let's look at the space of framed little disks, uh, the nth configuration space independently, uh, and observe that there is this forgetful map that forgets the configuration uh, and only remembers the orientations of the different circles. So I, I call this the orientation map. Uh, map. So, so if we have uh, a, con uh, for a configuration of parallel disks, it's 
first of all, a bunch of circles, and secondly, a bunch of angles. And these two interact uh, in the operation, when we play operation, but we can forget all of the configurations, all of the configuration data and only remember the angles. So gamma will go to the tuple theta one, theta two, theta three. Um, and so even though a priori, the way I wrote it, this is a map of spaces, you can, you can easily write this as a map of operands. So this is a map from the operator for individual disks to um, the operand that you could call com sub S1. So it's configuration spaces are just tuples of points of S1. Uh, and there's a kind of standard composition. Uh, the way you can think of this operand is, is algebras over this operand are S1 equivariant algebras, right? S1 equivariant algebras are a type of algebraic structure. So it's, it's um, encoded by an operand and, and this is it. Sorry, S1 equivariant commutative algebra, not, not just any. This is why I work common. So S1 equivariant commutative algebras are, are encoded by this tuple of angles. Uh, and um, now let's, let's look at this diagram. So inside of here we have, um, well, a map from the commutative operand. The commutative operand is just a point in each degree. So I'm gonna write it like this. Um, this is the terminal operand point. Of course, uh, when you actually work with algebras over this operand, you want to first resolve it. So this is equivalent to E infinity. Uh, but but um, th this this is a quite th th when we're looking at fibers th this is a quite nice diagram and and if we take the fiber of this diagram uh, then it, it's uh, equivalent to the homotopy fiber it's easy to so so it just follows from uh, the this diagram of topological spaces being a fiber diagram and so what is the fiber well the fiber is also an operand what is the operand is the operand uh, of configurations of frame little disks where all of the angles are zero. So of course, this is the operand of little disks. Um, so this is a pullback diagram of operands. Uh, and now the idea um, is that, well, we know, so um, this construction that I just told you about says that, that frame little disks are um, an operand uh, in log spaces. Um, and so this is also an operand in log spaces. This is in fact equivalent to an operand um, in algebraic geometry because, so this is algebra geometric because, well, S1 is equivalent to the, as a group uh, is homotopy equivalent to the group scheme G sub M. Um, and moreover, this map can be written down in the category of log schemes. And so we can just write down this diagram of the category of log schemes. This will give us uh, um, a diagram in the category of um, commutative algebras in, um, so, so, so from this we, we get, we get a, a diagram of algebras in motives. And so we can take a pullback. So there's, there's some pullback construction at the end that recovers uh, a certain um, artificially constructed motive and then you, you look at the, um, the underlying space, the Betty realization of this motive, and that is just um, chains on little disks. So this is, uh, this is how you get from frame little disks to little disks, you, you, you put it in a diagram. Uh, so maybe um, I have one minute left. Maybe I'll just say a few more words about why, why this is interesting. Um, uh, and so what are some, some additional, um, generalizations of this. Well, so first of all, as I said, the fact that uh, these diagrams are mo motivic on chain level that um, when you're working in characteristic zero, that's not really new. That work follows from this growth and dictate Miller theory and work of Tamarkin. Um, but so the really interesting um, things start to happen when, when instead of looking at these as, as just motives, you look at them as um, unstable motives. So, so you really do think about some some additional um, structures on, on these things that are not just chains. Uh, and so these are closely related to, to the theory of periods, to, to things like um, multi-zeta values. 
Um, and, and also this, this whole picture, well, not, not the little disks picture, but the frame little disks picture has a generalization to higher genus. And so then if you look at this generalization to higher genus and you look at the genus one case, then you can actually see the, the, the motivic structure here and um, the, uh, the motivic operad structures that we get um, I actually give you some immediate algebraic ways to prove certain conjectures um, that, that people had about um, certain uh, sort of uh, motivic maps that, that seemed mysterious and, and that required some, some hard analysis to prove so. So there are some results that were proven using uh, uh, elliptic uh, associators and, and some, some kind of rather elaborate integrals that um, at least if, if you can, if, if so, so this is something that, that I, maybe I should say at, um, at the moment is, is not done, but, but if, if this kind of, if an appropriate uh, motivic language, um, if you do this in appropriate motivic language, that then these these certain results in, in analysis and, and period theory should should follow that that, that used to be quite elaborate. So, so so the whole idea is that that this reduces certain a number of known results, but but that uh, used to be proven using some hard analysis and um, growth and technical theory to to basic algebraic geometry, except with this with this little wrinkle that it's logarithmic. So that's um, that's that, uh, and I guess now now it's time for questions. Uh, thank you.